Are you here to worship the Lord this morning? Amen. Let's just stand and look to the Lord this morning. Any prayer requests that we would, uh, before we start, unspoken or spoken? Unspoken, yes. All right, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee, we thank you, Lord, that you are mindful of thy children, Lord. Lord, we have come here to praise thee and worship thee this morning. Lord, I pray not only that you would look upon us, but look those that couldn't be here or those by the way of the Internet. Lord, we remember thy children, Israel, Lord, this time. But most of all, Lord, we have come to fellowship with thee. And, Lord, we commit this service in your hands and that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. A uh, little announcement. It's only for here in Moncton. You can be seated. There's two uh, <coughs> toilets that were put in for the men and the women. It's easy to understand where they're at. There's only one in each room. One, the men is at the extreme end, that end, and the women, you're on the extreme end, that end, in, in their room. Is that clear? All right. That's all I have to say. Just in case... Well, Brother Paul. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see everybody out. Thank you, Lord. Move on me, Holy Spirit. Move on me. Move on me, Holy Spirit, move on me, mold my heart and life to be what you would have me be, see you this morning, Sister Eva. Glad to see you here. Mercy rewrote my life. Mercy rewrote my life. I should have fallen my soul cast down but mercy
Thank you, Lord. Use your mic. Everything right. 
I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting today on the manna, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Across the bridge. There's no more sorrow Across the bridge There's no more pain The sun will shine Across that ridge Across the bridge There's no more sorrow Across the bridge There's no more pain Across that river, and will never be unhappy again. Across the river, there's no more sorrow. There is none like you No one else can touch my heart I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. Your mercy flows like a river wide. Suffering children are safe in your arms. There is no like you. There is no like you. 
No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. Your mercy flows like a river wide. I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. Search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is no like you. There is none like you. And we could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Praise the Lord.
me going on this this morning was Jacob wrestled with the Lord. And I think it was all night. And what I was thinking about was when he was there wrestling with the Lord, in my mind, Jacob was letting go of some things. And he was getting in the place where God could bless him. And he was crucifying things yes. and letting go of things. <clears throat> And getting in the place where the blessing of God could come into him and he could win that priestly title, as the songwriter said. And I told this story before, but they have a way of capturing monkeys. And they build a little box and they put a, a hole in it so the monkey can just stick his hand in there. And they put a little knock or a little trinket or something down in that box and the monkey reaches in and he grabs a hold of that trinket and he won't let go. In spite of it all, he won't let go. And they come up and they capture that monkey just like that. And in my flesh, in myself, if I'm going to hang on to something, it's that it's defeat. It's, it's, it's anything but living up to the image of Jesus Christ. And, and I just love him so much because of what he's done for me. And I just want to walk on with him. Monique, do you have a song this morning?
makes you realize just how much God cares for us too. Mm -hmm. We might not see it, but it happens quite more often than people will ever know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just grateful that he, he teaches me over the weeks, and I'm very grateful for it each time. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful this morning he's still working on me. And as we go through trials of life, and we call on to Jesus, and sometimes we get to the point where we think we have a handle on things, and uh, he puts us through a test, and the old flesh fails. Last little while, I was really been on my mind of of bridling the tongue, and yeah. and uh, so I'm really member. Yeah, got nothing nice to say. Don't say nothing at all. I really believe. We sometimes see in the cartoons where there's a good angel and a bad angel on both wings. 
on both the shoulders. That there's one saying, don't do it, and the other one saying, go ahead and do it. A thought that entered my mind was, if the thoughts are going through your mind, then you might as well speak it. You know, but you just keep your mouth shut and not say a word. Well, then this other little angel here would just say, well, you're a hypocrite. You're not saying what's on your mind. Yeah. And that's how things can go in trials of life. I, uh, I had brought it in prayer, and I thought, you know, if, if only we could keep that tongue the subject and think before you speak. Well, just, just like I said, once you think you have a handle on it, well, the Lord attests you, and once again we failed. But I'm just thankful that he's still working on me, and he's the one that's putting those thoughts in my mind that... Uh, There's a ways to go, but he knows. And he's the one that started it, and he'll finish it. Amen. Amen. We need a spirit-filled preacher To teach us We need our old-fashioned seekers We'll pray all not long we need some good gospel singer that was not going out of mind the church will triumph and go home in a little while he'll be worth it after all child he'll be worth after all After all of these trials We hear Jesus call He'll be worth it after all Child He'll be worth it after all After all of this climbing He'll be worth after all When you're down in the valley Prayer is all I can do But the Lord says deliverance And strengthens you Now if you're up on the mountain See me struggle along Lift my name up to Jesus And let's help each other make it home And it'll be worth it after all, child It'll be worth it after all After all of these trials we hear Jesus call He'll be worth it after all, child He'll be worth it after all After all of this climbing He'll be worth it after all We need our spirit still preacher Teach us right from wrong. We need our old fashioned seekers who will pray all night long. We need some good gospel singers to help us go another mile. The church will triumph. Home a little while, he'll be worth it 
it at the wrong time. He'll be working at the wrong. After all of these trials, we hear Jesus call. Yeah, he'll be working at the wrong time. He'll be working at the wrong. After all of this climbing, he'll be working at the wrong. When you're down in the valley, prayer is all you can do. But the Lord sends deliverance and strengthens you. Now if you're up on the mountain, you see me struggle alone. Lift my name up to Jesus And let the judgment make it home And it'll be worth it after all, child It'll be worth it after all After all of these trials We hear Jesus call He'll be worth it at the wrong child. He'll be worth it at the wrong. At the roll of this climbing, he'll be worth it at the wrong. At the roll of this climbing, he'll be worth at the wrong. something or do something but you got to be led by the spirit and I did I was struggling and I was struggling but I kept my eyes on I kept watching him and, and, I, and then he was sitting down just across from me and I was watching him and debating whether I should go over or just sit with beside him or just talk with him or I didn't really know what to do and then this woman came over and she sat beside him, and she started talking to him. And I could see that he was listening, and he kind of looked up his head, and he was kind of acknowledging. And I didn't know what I didn't know what she was saying to him, but he was acknowledging something. And uh, she sat with him for for uh, a good 10, 15 minutes, and then uh, I was just sitting down. And then I just had to look up, and I seen him coming towards me, and he sat down, he sat down beside me, and I just looked at him, and I started, I said, "How are you, Brandon? Brandon?" And uh, we just opened up, just like a, a little conversation, but he opened up a little bit, and uh, but you can tell that he really had a problem. Like, and that's why I feel that, you know, people would say, you know, churches are praying, churches are praying. For those of you who are taking the time to really take the time to pray, 
I pray that the Lord will move upon him and remember him because he needs prayer. He needs help. To, to definitely. Uh, so I would just uh, ask the church to remember him in prayer, that the Lord would touch him, help him in, in some way. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Gary.
time for your prayers and your thoughts. So much appreciated. God knows how to comfort his people. Um, the song, How Great Thou Art, the Lord really used that song to minister to me, to give me comfort. Uh, there was one night this week that I, I just couldn't sleep, and I got up and I tried to pray, but I couldn't pray. But that song kept going on in my mind, and I just kept singing it and singing it. And then um, yesterday at the funeral, that last song, that was a song that was sung. And uh, last night, someone posted that song on the internet, How Great Thou Art. And I feel that was the Lord just doing a small thing for me, just me, out of so many billion people. And uh, I appreciate the strength that we gain from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when we sang that song. He ministers us, ministers us in a unique way, custom made for us. And I'll just thank him for that. Lord, as we would look into your word, Lord, there's nothing in his vessel of clay except thy spirit comes on the scene, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that as we look into the subject this morning, that you be with every one of us, Lord, I pray. We ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see it this morning. If you're here this morning, it's not a day-to-day -day dream today. There's things that's come in this week that puts more light on the time coming up the road. And as I realize there's a there are those that are new and partly new and I tried to do it in one sermon last night but I realized that not everybody's at the same level. But it's something pertaining to that half hour silence. And pertaining to that half hour silence Yes, it's been mentioned, been, it's been in ever since the day of Brother Branham that there would be a half hour silence. And Brother Jackson as well. But you and I are the generation, if we don't go by the way of the grave, there are things in there of some parables that will point to this time frame here. In, I'd have to say through the movement today, it's almost similar to what Jesus had to say 
to the Pharisees when he was on ground in 33 AD. If you want a reference for the scriptures in Matthew chapter 21, verse 25. They were trying to catch Jesus in different ways to not to help him, but they were leery, uh, standing from a distance, or they didn't want to really hear from Jesus. And instead of them putting Jesus on the spot, Jesus puts them on the spot. He was talking, he talked about the baptism of John the Baptist. And he asked them that was there, that was trying to catch him, he says, Whence was it, John the Baptist, the baptism of John? Is it, is it from heaven or is it from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say it's from heaven, he'll say unto us, Why did you not believe him? And if they don't, then they were scared the people would be speaking against them. So they didn't reply why they didn't want to commit. That's what's happening in this hour. This half hour silence we've been talking about. The three watches of Luke chapter 12. If the Spirit of God was speaking, was saying, is this from heaven or is this from men? Or are we going to be like the Pharisees of old? Well, we're not going to say. It's either one or the other. Sometimes I wish the Lord would choose somebody else to be in this realm. But I feel the push to push on. I remember the dream that I had in year 2000. In that dream, it's the setting is in a schoolroom. School is out, and the desks are just thrown any which way because the janitor wants to come in to clean the room. So I find myself going into the room, and the desks were arranged in whatever directions, whatever it was, and I felt I needed to be there. So when I went in to sit down, here comes Brother Jackson. There were some other men's, I don't remember the name, but I know there were others there. He goes on the blackboard, and he starts writing things, and I'm trying to write them down, and they were coming fast. Coming so fast, I had a hard time to keep up. But I knew it was important concerning the time we're living in right now. That God would be bringing some things in a quick manner because time is getting short. If ever the book of Revelation or the, the Bible is to be opened up some things, surely we don't have another 20, 50 years. And so we're sitting in that classroom as I'm writing them down and I wish I could have took the dream and take the things I was writing because when I woke up, I couldn't remember what was written. I had wrote a lot of things. But I can see now, since 2001, the Lord has allowed us to see more nuggets in the hour that we're living in. Am I right on everything? That's up to the Lord. But I know some things are definitely right. They, f they fit into place. And so, this morning, I'll just give you an, uh, an overview, a brief view if you want to, but I'll have to break it down into different subjects, two subjects as we go along. It's uh, this one here, it is. There's three parables that deal with rewards. 
in the scriptures. And the rewards is what we're going to, the child of God is going to receive. But there are rewards to some children of God will only know about their reward when the millennium opens. But there are rewards that's going to be spoken even before we go to the wedding supper. Because the way Jesus explains it in the parables, he says, you shall be ruler over so many cities and so forth. There's no such thing as you shall be if you're in when the millennium starts. Were these idle words that Jesus spoke about? No. These parables deals with three or three classes of people, if you want to, in one sense. But when is Jesus going to let fulfill that parable that he's going to tell them of their reward? Are we going to be told that at the wedding supper in glory during the week of Daniel? Or just before we come down in the millennium? We'll look at some scriptures. And I realize there may be some that never got exposed to certain things uh, over the years because it took some 40 years for God to lay down some found fundamental things in the scripture. All right? So there is that parable of Matthew chapter 25 we're going to deal with. Luke chapter 19, Matthew chapter 20, and of course Luke chapter 12. Now, as a place to start, I want to go to Luke the 12th chapter to begin with. We've seen this scripture many, many times. Starting at verse 36. And not everybody has access to computers or Bibles of different translations. And so sometime when we read the English words, unless we know and we have a concordance to understand what those words are, then we can have different thoughts on a particular passage. So in Luke, I'm going slow, I'm, tr I'm trying to go slow so you, we can all catch it. If I speed through this, you'll be all, all kinds of questions later on. So in Luke, the 12th chapter, in verse 36, it says, and ye yourself, I got the scripture up here on the board if you want to look at it. On the, and ye yourself like unto the men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. And when he cometh and knocketh, he openeth, cometh, that they may open unto him immediately. So here it's talking about a coming. But if we don't know what that word marriage is about, you can put that in the week of Daniel, or it, it seems, where does this all fit? But somewhere we have to come to an understanding as a bride to know where that is at. If I put in, in today's modern English, if, if the translators were of today to translate that verse, it would be, it'll be like men that are looking for their Lord. So they're looking, they're watching for the Lord. And when he comes back, not when he leaves, coming back. Now there too, we have to look at when is that coming back located at? Because if we don't have a background of what's been taught these 40 years, we can say, oh, well, that's when he comes to take the bride out. Or that's when he comes in, in, the, in the millennium. No, it's not. 
We'll get to it in a minute. And be like men who are looking for their Lord. Now the reason they're looking for the Lord here, because later on in this parable, Jesus is speaking about two watches. But what you're reading in verse 36 is that first watch, and that's associated with Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. There's a watch there. That's the first watch. Luke doesn't mention what it is, but if when we read the scripture, it can only be at that particular time. All right? So he says, when men are, are looking for the Lord, when he comes back from the bride feast, and even then, the bride feast means the preparation of the bride feast. That is not the wedding supper in glory whatsoever. Because when the Lord comes down here, this bride feast he's been preparing for 2,000 years has taken place here on earth as he's dealing with earthly recipient for 2,000 of years of time. And so he, when he does come, he stresses the point, open immediately, don't play around. Now, when God says immediately, we look at immediately, oh, you mean this afternoon? No, in that generation. There ain't going to be other generations. Or when you get into certain watches, we need to know immediately. We don't want to know 10 years later what it's going to be. So God is stressing the point that when he comes, the door will be open uh, open unto him. Uh, sorry, when he comes... To the door, it will be open to him quickly. He's coming to what door? The door is found in Matthew. Matthew 25. Around verse 10. I'll put it back in the... Oh, I haven't got the wrong, the wrong place here. Okay, Matthew... 25, verse 10. Okay. So what is that door? We all read the parable in Matthew 25. And while they went to buy, that's your foolish virgins. And even today I hear things. People are mixed up about what, what is a foolish virgin? Well, if you don't know what their nature is, you can put them over here, over there, and they have different kind of ideas. Where, where, where are the foolish virgins? Are they in denomination? Are they in the bride? Or all over creation? No, they're not. Brother Branham answered that. God showed him. After the big revival of the 50s, when it was coming to a close, and Brother Jackson says, where are these people going? Why are they going to these charismatic movement? And Brother Bram told him, the Lord had showed him, these are your foolish virgin looking for oil. Now hear me this morning. Foolish virgins, their main outlook, they thirst for oil where the anointing is falling in a service. They're not concerned about revelation. And may I state this morning, foolish virgins are not going to argue with bride. They may come to see the bride in the environment that's been taking place since 1963. And they may come in, but they see it's too complicated. They leave. They won't argue with you. But a tear, he'll argue with you. But not a foolish virgin. The other thing, while well, dealing with this particular part, your foolish virgins are about the same number as there is wise virgins. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 25, there'd be five wise and five foolish. So now we have established a place where, go back to Luke chapter 12. So when he talks about he comes to the door. That's the door of Matthew 25, verse 10. 
when is that door, that door that started to be closed, started when the Lord came down with a shout and he closed the door to the foolish virgins. The bride, she goes in that door or in that place or the environment where she's receiving revelation. You say, Brother Fred, we all have heard this before. I know you have, most of you, but then there's young people. And sometimes it's good to review. So now as the bride from 63 is now going into that door, and I can bring in at the same time when concerning 63 or 67 within that period of time, you have the times of the Gentile is finished in 67 because when Jerusalem, that city is no longer occupied by Gentiles, we're now in what Paul calls the fullness of the Gentile. So as God's pulling individuals, to com- fullness means to complete the Gentile. So he's calling individuals and the bride is that fullness that's going into that door. Not everyone that's going into the door. And may I say... When the door is closed, it's closed to the foolish virgins. But trotting along with the bride going in that door is your tears. There's been tears since 1963. There's been, they've been there. And they've been following the bride all along these messages. Whether Brother Branham, Brother Jackson, or this hour. Oh, well, I thought when we get in that door, the tears are gone. No, they're not. The foolish virgins are. So now if you're looking at foolish virgins, when are they going to be dealt with? When have they been dealt with? Or how do I identify them? They are looking for anointed meetings. That's the oil they're looking for. They threw away some of their doctrines just for the oil of the anointing in places where it goes. You had the charismatic and so forth. Is that understood here this morning? All right. Now we're in, into Luke again. And I'll put it back into the... There. Is it easier doing it this way with the scriptures up on the board? Okay. Now, okay, I've got to go to, to Luke here again. History. Here we go. Now, it says, Happy are those servants whom are watching when the Lord comes. Now, if you don't know how to place and where that Lord is, when the Lord comes, then the rest of the, this chapter is not going to do you any good whatsoever. By revelation. The bride has come to an understanding when the Lord is coming in this way to feed servants. That is your 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse 4, I should say, verse 16, when the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. And that shout, we hear a shout as if, oh, somebody shouted, it took two seconds for make a shout. This shout is a message that will last from 63 till the bride gets ready. It's also the carcass in that period of time. Happy are those servants who are watching when the Lord comes. Truly I say, he, will make, he makes himself, sorry, he will make himself their servants and place, okay, this is probably in the, uh, in the English, in, you, you're more familiar with the uh, authorized version. Oh, how come they got back there? Luke chapter 12, 36, 37. All right, so he says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, finds a watching. I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet. They're not sitting down to meet in glory. Because, again, to read emphasize 
that preceding verse talks about the marriage. If the marriage up there and then he's coming down to feed them down on the earth, that's a misnomer. That don't fit. So the marriage means the preparation of the marriage feast. And there's, if you're preparing a feast for a marriage, now we look at it in today's way weddings are done. But in those days, yes, you needed a place to bring the crowd in. But you send out invitations to bring them in for the wedding to actually take place. So the wedding preparation, the Lord has been calling for almost 2,000 years, those that would be guests in that wedding feast that will, yes, will take place at the wedding supper and the, up in glory. The wedding place, the wedding takes place down here. All right. Now that we are understanding where that's coming from, it says, Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to me and will come forth. That was, he comes forth, that means he's coming forth from where? From glory, to, in a message to serve them down here. When did that start? 1963. Because prior to that hour, yes, there was the cry, but that was just to restore what was already taught to the apostles 2,000 years ago. That is not serving me, that is restoring meat that was lost. But from 63 onward, now you have meat that is being brought forth, and he's serving them. The Lord is serving them. So how is he serving them? He's serving them, yes. He started with a prophet. Then he used an apostle. Then he's using a fivefold ministry. And the way it looks like today, looks like there's nobody serving and the serving is only the thing that's already been done back here. That is not me. Things of days gone by, whether it is 10 years, 20, 50, 100 years ago, that is not fresh meat. The Lord did, he served it there. He doesn't have to reserve it here. So if he's serving fresh meat, he's serving things that he's opening up in his word. All right. So you make them come down and serve them. Now, the them that are there, whether you're from 63 even to 2017, these servants, he doesn't say, I'm going to feed wise servants. He's actually feeding those that are in the atmosphere where the Spirit of God, where the revelation being preached. You have tares and you have true, true servants. Both are sitting there and listening. One is from an intellectual standpoint, and the other one is from a revelatory standpoint. And while they are in the process of their growth till the time they're used, you can't hardly tell them apart till they actually are brought to the place where they have to step into their ministry. Then, at that time, you will know what's a true servant or what's a tear servant. Now it's, well, it's so, it's so, I'm scared. Are you saved? Do you have the Holy Ghost? Then pray tell me, God can't keep you? Our trust is in him. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 47, he says he's going to remove everything that offends or commits iniquity. That's not your foolish virgins. That's your tares. That's been following this message. And so God as starts bringing things out. As, a, as tares would bring their revelation on ground. When God brings a true revelation. It kills that all to pieces. While the true servant. The tares can't destroy the true revelation. Not to the bride, he don't. Well, praise the Lord. All right. That's, you've heard. I'm just going over some things that, that you understand. Or you that's been following, been in the message for, for a long time, you all, I believe, know this. Unless you've been daydreaming and 
What? What was that about? Uh, what's this? All right. Well, leaving that aside. So this serving that he's come down to serve them, it's not over yet. The Lord is not limited with time. Jesus will never die. He's on the throne of glory. He's sitting on that throne. And he's speaking from heaven. Because really when the true revelation comes down, it's the Lord speaking from heaven. It's one thing to speak against a man in a false revelation. But make sure it is false. Because if it is from God, then you're speaking against him that's speaking from heaven. And so therefore, the consequences are pretty severe. In time, it'll show where things are going. So while this is taking place, while this meat is being served till the bride comes to her perfection, and for verse 38, for a long time, nobody touched it, nobody knew about it, not that they didn't know it was written there, it was there. And in the past, some have maybe commented on it, that's fine. But there comes an hour where God's taking it off the pages and now putting it into reality on ground. And if he shall come in the second watch, I remember back in the 70s and the 80s, what's he mean, the second watch? What's, what's, it's kind of confusing there. What's to it? And then, and then he says, and come in the third watch. No, a third one. What's that all about? Well, we're watching for the Lord. We, we need to get our inner man ready, and we've got to watch. No. Yes, it is part of it. But the emphasis is on watching the revelation of when he's coming. Because the things we're going to be getting into just knowing that there's thunders coming. This is going to open up a little bit more of a window. What to expect. And if I'm just staying with Brother Brown's message or Brother Jackson's message, this will start moving away. Those that should have been watching will not be ready for that hour. And they may be beaten with few stripes or many stripes. They're not lost. Those particular ones that fulfill that category are not lost. There is the evil servant. Yes, he's that tear. All right. So if he comes in the second watch or the third, blessed are those servants. So they're watching for his coming. Yes, while that's transpiring, every child of God needs to watch how he lives. That's been true from 33 A.D., he didn't tell them in 33 A.D., watch the second and the third watch. It wasn't even applicable to them. Things weren't down to the place where meat was going to be served here at the end time. So therefore, watching for your soul has been to every child of God ever since the Holy Ghost was given in the day of Pentecost up to our hour. So to mix in and to throw in here and highlight it, well, this is mainly only talking about watching how you live for the Lord, I'd say, no, it's not that only. It's primarily concerning seeing the events of the time you're living in. Because as each watch, As each watch comes on the scene, it is pertaining more information when the Lord is coming. Now we were in Luke. The, oh, here maybe is it too small for you? There, is that is that better? Okay. So from the first watch, if you want to, is during the time of Brother Branham, forty-seven to. 1967. There's a transitional period of time. Don't get stuck on a date, but somewhere we have to put a reference for one is changing to another to as a identification. 
and the identification for these watch are under the major ministry when God changes over from a prophetic ministry, an apostle, yes, he's part of the fivefold ministry, but his main function was to teach servants. Then in the third watch, it's the time of the servants that have been instructed how they are proceeding forward. That's concerning the watches that we're looking at in the hour that we live in. And so therefore, just as those of the days of Brother Branham, they're watching for the Lord. Brother Branham thought he would come in his day. They even had dates, 1977 and 83 and other dates. They were looking for the Lord, but they don't have enough information to know when and how close you are when he's actually going to come. So those in the days of Brother Branham, of the Branham movement, they can see that the Lord's going to come. That there's such thing as thunders. Six seals revealed. Now some of them had gone haywire. Say there's seven, and you've got to find the seventh one in the books. That's a hogwash. That's just a man's idea. Because it's, and when that was brought, after Brother Branham died, that the, the seventh seal is in those messages, time has gone on long enough, that proves to be a false revelation. God will bring truth and it will kill a false one. So now as we are moving on in time, in the days of Brother Jackson, we got more, a whole lot more information concerning how close the Lord is coming. Now we're watching for his coming. Yes, there was a lot of revelation revealed from 67 to 2004, or 5 if you want to. But not all was pointing to the Lord's coming. But he did preach something important. Had, he not, had the Lord not shown him this part, we couldn't see what we're seeing today. When he preached on the times and the seasons... That what Jesus was speaking about is Jesus now, after his resurrection, before he goes up in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 7, his disciples are asking, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And, he's, and he, told, he tells them, he didn't, not that he wanted, he wasn't rude, he's just telling them the truth. Sometimes the truth is hard to swallow. They, and if they were, these were Jews, of course, they have an excuse. Us Gentiles, we want to know now, not tomorrow. If it had been to us Gentiles, we would have reacted. So what did Jesus tell them? He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. And he had a good reason to tell them that. Because to know the times and the seasons, they didn't know the 2,000 years of history, how things would unfold. It was, would have been meaningless to tell them. But there would come a day, those simple words Jesus said, the time and the seasons, would be important to a generation because they were looking for the Lord's coming. The Lord said, that when I'm going to come, forget it, boys. It's not for you to know when. Because you... He could have told them, he could have probably told them and discouraged them, it's not going to happen in your generation. Now remember, the Lord always keeps everyone waiting that they could come in your time. So now as it goes, time moves on, and we're near here at the end. The Lord brings down a revelation that the times meant centuries. Seasons meant decades. And Brother Jackson had brought that out in a, in, a, in a contender or two contenders. But he didn't go to the point this, that we're talking about this morning. When would those centuries end? You can search the contenders if you want in the messages. Those centuries ended and it was very simple. It just had to be brought out. It's like Marco Polo that we found in front of that crowd. 
And he says, who can make an egg stand on its ends? And they couldn't do it, and they were fumbling around and everything else. Then he said, well, it can't be done. They all said that. He takes the egg, gives it a little snap, and stood up. He says, well, anybody can do that. Yeah, but you had to see it first. So the centuries ended in 1948 when Israel became a nation. Why? Well, that's just the day, Brother Fred. Well, Jesus says these words in it. That generation shall not pass away till everything be fulfilled. In other words, that generation is not going to run another hundred years. That's what it's saying. I mean, it's self-evident. And so therefore, we know that these centuries has stopped, revelatory-wise, here. Now, why did God hold that off till our hour? He could have revealed that in the days of Brother Branham. Or in the days of brother, when Brother Jackson brought the time and the seasons. Because we could have got confused. Is it when the bud puts forth a branch... Or is it when the leaves are being brought forth? doesn't say they're all there in the process of being bringing forth. That's why God waited to this hour to drop that revelation in there that the centuries were over. And we know that the generation of 1948, now some got calculators, 1948. I was born in 1947, 48, 49. No, it's the generation of 20 years or so, as it spoke about in the days of Moses, coming out of the wilderness, the generation starts at 18 or 20 years old. Well, you say, is it 18 or 20? What difference does it make? It's only a year or two. Some people want to get so technical. Well, we have to look at certain things this morning. So now as that, we know that a generation starts from 20 years on up. Well, the people that saw... 1948 is your World War II veterans, that generation. And I've seen a documentary about the Battle of Britain. They only had very few men, and they're all in wheelchairs, and they can hardly maybe put some sentence together because of age. That's the generation going to know what's everything being fulfilled. First of all, everything is not fulfilled and it's going to be at least another 10 years or so. Now you say, you're putting a number. I'm using that as an example. That generation will be gone. So therefore, the generation of 48 is not the time frame that he talks about. That generation will fulfill everything. But in, 1947, in 1967, when Israel became a nation, when Israel captured Jerusalem, in that six-day war, that gave, yes, it, they had the cities no longer under Gentile rule. But when in that war, they captured more land. And more land, you could put leaves, which is people on the ground. So the leaves are starting. To give you a point, I don't have on that chart, but in 1948, there was 650,000 Jews that went into the land. By the time you reach 1967, there were almost 3 million. These were starting to be put on. Today, there's 8.4 million. There's a whole lot more leaves. So we've been going on in time. So that's why, and when we're looking at if the Lord used a prophetic event to mark the end of centuries, then you have to use a prophetic event to mark when that last generation is going to be, 1967. That's a prophetic event. Jerusalem no longer occupied by the Gentiles. Now from 1967 up to 2017, you have gone through five, generations, five decades. Now in the Bible, in Psalms, it talks about the life of a man it's three score and ten, which is 70 years. And by strength, four score, 80. Now, the other time when I dealt with this, I said it was 90. I was wrong there. 
And hang me on that. Please, try. Go for it. I can make blunders, but it doesn't change the picture. So if five generations, five decades have, not generations, five decades have gone on, there's only two left. Unless the leaves is the wrong place to mark it. Then it'll have to be whatever. What was, all right? So if there's two decades left, we're in 2017. That's five decades has gone by. And within those two decades, the bride is to see or well, that generation will not pass away till everything is fulfilled. And if it took a prophetic ev- happening that we can put a date, then we're going to know how close we are. Because when you read Matthew 24, verse 32, when Jesus talks about that fig tree putting forth a branch, is there marked in the Bible, in the original writing, 1948 there? No. We know 1948 because of the prophetic event. In 1967, Jerusalem, is because there's a prophetic event. That's why we can put a date on there. And when this miracle war happens, we will be able to put a date on it. And I assure you this morning, from that point, that miracle war, you are in the last decade Because the things to be fulfilled will not take 10 years. That decade may last 10 years, but it doesn't mean it has to last 10 years. So we are now knowing more understanding than they did in the days of Brother Branham concerning the Lord's coming. More than in the days of Brother Jackson. Does that make us any better or more spiritual? No, but somewhere something has to be brought forth to look at this. We can't run around in circles. Well, this is what what was been revealed, and, and nobody dares to step over the boundary. If it's not your ministry, that's fine. But surely the bride, God has been leading her since 2005. Now, I haven't got to the message I want to deal with yet. But I'm laying this groundwork again for what I'm going to be looking at. I don't know if... I'm going to be doing it tonight or next week, so. But I guarantee you, when we start looking at some things, that half hour silence is more important than you realize. And the time has come, God is opening up some things that are going to be involved in it that wasn't dealt with in the days of Brother Branham or the days of Brother Jackson. But now is the hour. And by what I'm seeing in there, it's telling me we're getting pretty close for the bride to come to her completion. Because if the Lord's leading in that direction, it's, there's something about it. So now, we've seen decades and so forth. We are knowing that at least when these things are going to be transpiring. The third watch is here at just, we're in that third watch. The watches has to do with the changes of the guard of the ministry that God's using. A prophet, an apostle, yes, he's part of the fivefold ministry, but now it's those servants that were studied under that apostle. That's the third watch. If all we needed to watch is what Brother Branham told us and Brother Jackson, you wouldn't need what I'm going to be speaking about in the next few few sermons. What's no problem? What's the use? Why? Why is it important? It's important in this manner. As we get closer... If I'm just staying, if I'm looking at it from a Brandon's point of view, yes, I know there's supposed to be thunders, but I have no clue when. And if God said to 
watch, that means there's going to be a group of people, it's going to be only for them that are watching to know when that is actually going to transpire. Brother Jackson brought us a little closer in the watch. But we're moving on a little further, little by little, nugget by nugget, a little here, a little there, that once we get to a place that we know now not just decades, but we get within months, then that bride will know when those thunders are going to be coming. And I can see those days of, those in the Brother Jackson message. Well, we don't need to know that. It says when, when, uh, there's going to be the miracle war, the building of the temple, and then there's going to be the Ezekiel war, and then, then you know, we know it's going to happen. It may not to you. You haven't been watching. Your house may be broken into. That's why Luke talks about here that the man that wasn't watching, his house was broken. He didn't call him a tear, but he was, didn't want to look in what was being brought in that third watch. He was just concerned with what's brought in that second watch. That's as plain as I can put it this morning. And time has fleeted on. But brothers and sisters, I'm thankful that the Lord hasn't left us without any meat or food. Now this has all been reviewed, if you want to. We all, we all heard this, but I'm just re- laying a background for over the next couple of messages that I want to deal with. Because we're going to be dealing with rewards. Some of it's going to be dealt with in the actual Lord's physical com- second coming. They're only told when it's actually happening. That's your white robes. But the bride, there's two elements in the bride. There's a living element and there's a deceased element. They're going to be told of their reward before they actually step into their reward. And that's not going to be dealt with at the wedding supper. Because what I see in the scriptures is going to be dealt with in that half hour space of time. Well, I don't know, maybe stay tuned. But brothers and sisters, is this going to be the end all? No. But it's just one more nugget to getting closer of understanding of the period of time that is in front of us. Verse 39, I'll repeat it again. And if and know this if the good man, he didn't say did he call him an evil servant? In Luke? I still got it here. And if the good man of the house had known what hour, not season, not minutes, but at what hour, getting close, the thief would have come and he would have had watched and not suffered his house to be broken. How did the thief come? The thief is none other but Satan. He says, you don't have to listen to what the fivefold ministry is saying today. Because this particular servant is going out in left field somewhere. Just stay with what Brother Jackson brought. So this thief is is telling this good man, don't watch the things that are happening. That the Lord is bringing down. And he whispers in the ears. You don't have. That's, we don't really need that. We, all we need is what we got back here. Well. According to this parable. Jesus says. If the good man. Of the house had known. What hour the thief would come. 
And the good man does not know the hour he comes in. It's the influence of Satan trying to hinder or blind the, this particular servant to move on further in that third watch. He would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Now what breaks the house? Not when he's saying, well, I don't think it's, this is of God or, or I'm not going to be touching that. It's when the Lord actually comes, when he peels that seventh seal and he comes off that mercy seat and he sends that angelic being that's speaking for him on the earth at that time, because there's things that are going to be said in the thunders, the bride has been watching, will know what to watch for, and she's been ready for it, while those servants that stayed with just Brother Jackson's message only, that that time, when the truth comes on ground, and the reality, when that angel Revelation chapter 10 comes, and he brings a vision of Brother Branham on the scene, Everybody will know that seventh seal is broke. I don't care what message you're in, whether it's Branham, Jackson, or this hour. In that vision, it's going to speak. And this good man says, well, I didn't know that, that, Lord, you spoke those things leading up to your time. And so what it does to his people, well, we didn't know, you should have told us. You should have been watching. They weren't watching. Does that mean every service like that? No, but there's going to be a category that will fulfill this part. There'll be a category that will fulfill, and the one that should have been watching, his penalty is shown a little further in verse 47 and, and verse 46 in that area. No, it's, in, it's not in this one here. At the same time, there's this parable that talks about that him that should have known will be beaten with stripes, few stripes. Uh, that didn't know, he's beaten with few stripes. The man that knew that he should have been watching, he's going to be beaten with a lot of stripes. Now what does those stripes mean? It's, they're not going into utter darkness. It means it's a stripe against their revelation that they should, the place they should have been. It's just like a man that goes into a company and he's working away and his boss says, well, you need to study this area that you're going to be into. And so he just bought, no, I'm not bothered, I'm in the company, I'm doing my thing. But then when the boss actually comes, he says, I, didn't I tell you to read this section here that you were supposed to be responsible for? He could give him a pink slip, but he gives him a warning. So if that man takes a hit on his pride, he should have been doing what he should have been doing. Nobody likes to be caught in that kind of position. And so are those servants that didn't know the Lord's will. What part of the will that they didn't know the Lord? I believe every servant knows John 3.16. I'm sure every servant knows the basic principal doctrines of, of, the, of Christ and the thing Paul's taught. But the things they did not know is the warning Jesus is giving in Luke. You should have been watching, not for things of the past, but for your day. And I can see, well, we don't really need that. He's sounding off again. There's coming a day. This is going to hit the pavement. There's coming a day. God's going to test this movement. Have you been watching? Or have you been playing? The baptism of John, is it of men? Or is it of heaven? The half hour of silence, is it of men or is it of heaven? The three watches, are that of men or is that of heaven? 
Ears are burning this morning. But if we've been walking with truth, seeing it, praise God. Because I don't know about you, but I, I'm thrilled that God has opened up some things for this day. But I want to deal with those other parables. Luke chapter 19. Okay, it's not there. I'll put it this way. Luke chapter 19 transpired from 1963 onward. It's at the end time. Because we'll see the introduction shows you it's speaking from an end time position. The parable in Matthew chapter 25 is from the position of the early church starting. Because Jesus says he's going to a far country. That he's going away. He didn't go away for a week or two or a month or a vacation. He's going to be gone for 2,000 years or more. But the one in Luke, he says, he's come from that far country and he's come down. And in Luke chapter 19, there's two comings in it. And I'll deal with that when I, when I get into that area. That's going to open up some things, brothers and sisters, that we're going to look at in the next few, few services. So uh, time has gone on now. It's over an hour, and the Lord knows. Are you still happy? Yes, I realize there's going to be a lot of questions. But if you give me time for the next couple of services, I believe this will open up a window that will understand a whole lot more than we do today. God has not finished in instructing and leading this bride. And praise God, I, I'm thankful. I'm thankful he left some meat for this hour. There may be little portion of steaks, because the big portion of steaks was done in the days of Brother Jackson. Now, without Brother Jackson, could have not went any further than had not Brother Branham come. And the fivefold ministry could not go any could not go any further without what Brother Jackson brought. Now, it's not Brother Branham, it's not Brother Jackson, it's not the fivefold ministry. It's the Lord speaking from heaven. Oh, well, we see that scripture. Well, we can't see that being so. Well, if the Lord's speaking from heaven today, or has been speaking, what do you think he's been saying? Or how did he say it? Who's he saying it to? I don't know. Yes, you do and you don't want to know sometimes. I better stop there because I might go too far. I see things I wish I didn't see sometimes. And it wouldn't be beneficial to, to speak the things that I see is coming down the road. Why do I even bother going in this? If I didn't care, I wouldn't even touch them. I'd have the internet turned off so only a few selected people would get to hear because I wouldn't want to disturb them. If I didn't care, that's what I would do. But if I believe what God is dealing with me and do care, that's why I minister the way I do. It's not to put people down and get people all frustrated. It's, it's shake up, wake up, warning, watching. It's like a man going, he's walking along, he's not watching where he's going, and there's a cliff. 
Oh, it's fine day, brother. The sun's shining. Just look up at the sky. Look at the, uh, look at the clouds. And he falls off the cliff. I, I didn't love him. What if I say, hey, you better get your eyes off of the clouds and watch where you're going because there's a cliff here. Well, praise the Lord. Well, we'll see how. Maybe tonight. Brother Ray, is, does it make any difference to you? Or if you have something, I've, I've, I don't need to preach. I don't have to preach every day. The less I preach, sometimes the better it is. So. But I feel, feel this is important. So, Let's just stand at this time. Have your musicians to come in case someone has a need and so forth. So. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. I love you, adore you, bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. I love you, adore you, I bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. love you, adore you, I bow down before you, Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Thanks, thanks, I give you thanks. I am so blessed My soul has found rest Oh Lord I give you thanks 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 I give you thanks For all you have done I am so blessed, my soul has found rest, oh Lord, I give you thanks, 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 I give you thanks for all you have done. I am so 
so blessed my soul has found rest oh lord i give you thanks well praise the lord what an hour we're living in. Yes. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand. Brother Elijah, if you'd dismiss us from a word of prayer this morning. Amen. Amen.